Good morning, church. Glad you're joining us for worship today. You know, because this is a recorded worship service, you can really watch it whenever you want. You could watch part of this worship service as your halftime entertainment tonight for the Super Bowl. Think about it. Anyway, we are glad you're here. Uh, you are loved and you are part of the church family. Now let's worship. morning church family listen to the words of the psalmist and let them inspire you to worship this morning praise the Lord O my soul O Lord my God you are very great you are clothed with splendor and majesty you wrap yourself in light as with a garment you stretch out the heavens like a tent and make the clouds your chariot Let's stand together as we give praises to our great God.
is our God. We call on our God now to come and be present with us in this place. Come thou fount of every blessing.
in prayer. Oh, Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise. May our hearts be tuned to not only sing your praise, but also to follow your will and your plan for our lives. Bind our wandering hearts to thee, O Lord. And may we build our lives on your firm foundation. We pray this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. From 1967 to 1989, the actor Jesse White appeared in 68 commercials as the Maytag repairman. That's a long time. And dressed in his iconic blue uniform, he would, throughout the years, always complain about being the loneliest man in town. Lonely because Maytag appliances were so gosh darn dependable, they just never needed to be repaired. And so no one ever came to see him. It's a very sad story. <laughs> you know, I would assume that Jesse White remained at the heart of Maytag's advertising campaign for all those years because he must have done a good job at selling appliances. I suspect that the Maytag repairman was such a successful advertising character because he sold people something they wanted to believe. He sold them the promise of a problem-free life. A life where nothing breaks down. A life where everything works like it should. But as is often true in the world of advertising, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot that was true in the world of advertising, especially with this idea. Because we all know that things break down. Appliances break down all the time. And problems and trials of all sort pop, sorts pop up, even un unrelated completely to dishwashers and refrigerators. You know, trials and problems pop up when you least expect them and all over the place. And I hope by now that you know that the idea uh, of a problem-free existence is truly the stuff of Madison Avenue and Hollywood. Real life, we know, is full of trials. You know this. I don't have to tell you this. You know this because you live in the real world. You've been living this out for at least the past year. I mean, right now in this moment, our shared experience is not of the Super Bowl. Our shared experience is of a trial. It's of dealing with COVID. You know, while I like to think that we'd all like to lead problem-free lives, I don't think many of us really expect that that's going to happen anytime soon. So we need to get used to it. We need to figure out how do we as Christians navigate a life that is filled with problems and trials and difficulties and come through it, not just in one piece, but actually better than when we started. How do we come through this better? You know, the book of James gives us some pretty good guidance on this. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at what James has to tell us about how to live a wise life in the face of trials. Now, I will warn you in advance, you need to prepare yourselves because James, he's going to get in your business. He, James is that friend that we all have who has no social filter. He just tells you very bluntly when you're being an idiot. So fair warning, James is going to meddle in your life and I'm telling you this because I know because he's already started meddling in my life. All right, well, let's get started. We're going to start today by looking at uh, just the greeting portion of the first chapter of the book of James. Before we get into all this stuff, I want you to have a little bit of context. And we find some right off the bat here in James 1 verse 1 where it says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. That's it. That's the greeting to this letter that James wrote. I tried to warn you. I tried to tell you this is that blunt friend with no social filter. Uh, there's nothing sentimental here. Did you catch that? I mean, but there are some things that we can learn about James and this particular letter. I, mean, I should probably point out at this point that the James we're talking about here is widely believed to have been the half-brother of Jesus. He was the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, a church which was made up mostly of Jewish Christians. So this is all to say that James was someone who had a role of influence and authority in the early church. 
And since the letter here is addressed to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, uh, this likely refers to the fact that James was, refer was writing to those Jewish Christians from the early church who left Jerusalem when widespread persecution broke out. Uh, and that's, I mean, pretty much all that we get here for a greeting. I mean, he just says greetings. I mean, it's the all-time worst greeting that you could give anybody in a letter. Uh, it's not really going to butter anybody up or soften the blow for what's coming later. Just straight up greetings. Uh, there aren't any of the personal touches that we typically would associate with, say, you know, I don't know, Paul's letters. Instead, what we have here is a letter written to a, a varied group of Christians to help them stay strong in the faith. A letter meant to encourage them uh, to make it through, to push through trials of various sorts, to tell them how they can endure such trials and come out even better on the other side. So after his brief word of greeting, James quickly moves into the first portion of his letter. In this first portion of the book of James, what we find in chapter 1 really introduces the big themes that he'll tackle through the rest of the letter. And the main point that James is tackling here is this. God works through the trials of life to grow us in the faith. Let me say it one more time. God works through the trials of life to grow us in the faith. Let's see how James lays things out for us. He begins in verse 2 like this. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, when bad things happen in your life, you need to know that there's a way of viewing and living through that bad situation, through those bad things, that will actually lead you to grow in your faith. That's a pretty incredible thing if you think about it, isn't it? James says that you need to start seeing trials as opportunities for growth. Because when trials come up and your faith is put to the test, there's a benefit to this because it results in perseverance, and perseverance leads you to maturity. Now, I got to tell you, this is totally one of those lessons that sounds all well and good, <laughs> and I certainly believe it to be true. But I've got to confess to you this morning, even though I know that God is going to grow my faith through trials that I experience, I still struggle to count those trials in my own life as an occasion for celebration. You know what I mean? I mean, I've had my fair share of trials, and I know that God has matured my faith as I've lived through those difficult situations, but in each case, you know, I've had to rely on Him to get me through, and He has grown me. Those trials in my past have definitely made me a more mature, stronger Christian, but you know, they were still rough. They weren't exactly fun times. I mean, I remember, for instance, a period in time before I came to work here, I was doing uh, BCM work in Conway and felt like at the time that God was calling me to leave my job, but he didn't really tell me what was coming next. And so for a few months, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was unemployed. That was a really stressful, trying experience. But during that time, here's what happened. I sought the Lord every day and I felt close to him. And I actually grew in my faith during that time. And so I can look back and see what James means here. I can see that that was true in my life in this particular situation. You know, he says to count it as pure joy when you face trials. Uh, and I get why he says that. Looking back, I can see that that's true, that I should have seen that as a joyful opportunity but in the, in the moment, while I was living through it, the unemployment part of all of that was just really awful. You know, but I can see that the end result was, in fact, good. And I think this is what James wants us to see, that, you know, there are going to be bad times. And, yeah, bad times are bad when you're living through them. But you need to know that God can bring good out of bad situations. He goes on to provide a little bit of encouragement to his audience to give them a few strategies that they can use that will help them to navigate the trials of life, that will help get them to a place where they can start to see trials, not as just uh, obstacles to overcome, but as opportunities for growth. There are three pointers that he gives. First off, he lets them know that 
that God will give us wisdom to face trials. He also tells them that they need to be motivated by the thought that better days are ahead. And finally, he calls on his audience to never forget that God is the giver of all good things. Let's take a look at these just really briefly here. First, he says that God will give us wisdom to see trials as opportunities. Look, James knows that life is tough and that we all need some help sometimes. And part of the help that we need is with our perspective. It's with our vision. You know, when it comes to problems, we need help seeing the good side of bad times. And James says that God is willing to help us see life clearly. I mean, just look at how he says this in verse 5. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. In other words, ask God to help you see the trials of life for what they are, temporary moments of pain that are shaping you and preparing you for all eternity. I mean, ask God to help you see the world as He has ordered it. That's what real godly wisdom is all about, being able to see life as God has designed it to work. Well, he goes on from this to say that we also can find a little bit of help, a little bit of motivation by looking to the future. He says, when you're struggling and living through life's trials, when you're in that moment and it doesn't feel very fun, it doesn't feel very good, he says, one thing you can do to help you in those moments is to hold on to the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. He says, in, it's like in Him, you know that things are going to be better one day. There's something on the other side of the trial that you're experiencing right now. Look at verse 12. He says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because he has stood the test. He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. So just know that when you endure trials in the moment, and you make it through, on the other side, there will be a crown of life for you. There will be a great reward for you. That's where you're headed, toward a time of wholeness and happiness with God. Whatever pain and hurt you're experiencing right now because of whatever trial you're experiencing, it will not last. In the end, we will be with Him, living life as He intended it to be. The knowledge of what lies ahead for us should give us another bit of motivation to stay strong when things get tough in the present. Finally, in this opening chapter of the book of James, James tells us to never forget that God is good. Before he wraps up this opening thought, he wants his audience to be clear on this one thing. God is a good God who blesses us richly in Christ Jesus. Every good and perfect gift is from above, James says. Now, this is such an important thing for us to get, folks, because for many of us, when we do experience the trials of life and we've established that the trials are coming and they ain't stopping anytime soon, uh, many of us want to blame God when things don't go according to our plan. When something goes wrong, we want to blame Him. We want to get angry with Him. We question His goodness. But James reminds us God's not tormenting us. When the bad things happen in your life, it could be a couple of different things. It could either it could be just a thing that happened, or it could be a spiritual attack by the enemy, or it could be a result even of your own sinful desire. You know, it could be random, in other words, or it could be some kind of weird self-harm. So James reminds us, you know, bad things, they're not coming to us from God. He's not doing it to be mean. He's not letting things happen to us to be mean to us. You don't need to lose sight of the fact that God wants you to be whole and healthy and full of joy and alive with Him. And part of the way He gets you there is by refining your faith, by letting you go through these tr- the trials of this life and, co- and leaning on Him while you do it. So try this week to step back from the craziness of these days, these weird days that we live in. Step back, take a deep breath, and ask your good Father in heaven to help you navigate through all of this crazy mess. Ask Him to use these trying times to grow your faith. Will you pray with me? Kind Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your great, great love. 
Thank you for saving us from our sins and from ourselves in Christ Jesus. You have blessed us with every good thing in Jesus. We ask you today, please open our eyes. Help us to see your blessings and help us to see the trials we all experience as a way to grow closer to you. Help us to be good to our neighbors. Help us to love them. Help us to be good to ourselves and help us to know that we are loved by you. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the new life you give us in him. Amen. Church family, I hope you have a wonderful week. Until we see each other again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.